All right. Okay, good vach. Torah says that when Av enters, we're supposed to decrease in joy. The Hasidic masters say that when Av enters, we have to increase in joy. And by increasing in joy, we lessen and we transform all the calamities that happen in the month of Av. So, Baruch Hashem, um, we're not just in the month of Av, but we're deep in the month of Av after the ninth of Av, after Shabbos of Comfort. And this teaching, which I just shared from the Hasidic Masters, I want to tell you a little bit more about the author of this teaching, whose yard site was actually in the first day of Tammuz. Um, was, his yard site was 200 years ago. And his name was Rab Kleinimus Kalman Halevi Epstein. <coughs> he lived in the city of Krakow, the same city as the Ramah, Meshesulis, and the Bach, prominent Torah leaders. And um, he wasn't from a very well-to-do family. His family was actually suffering a lot. And uh, he had to sell kichel. He sold little um, cakes in the marketplace uh, in order to help, to help his family uh, as a little child even go to school. He would just sold kichel in the marketplace. So one day he is in the marketplace and it's raining and it's, he's afraid he's going to... Um, Get sick, it's so, it's so, what, it, weather's so bad. So he goes into this shul. And the first time in his life, he sees, he went into the shul actually that originally was made by the Bayez Chadash, one of the most prominent uh, halachic authorities. And he goes into the shul and he sees for the first time uh, Torah being studied in an amazing way that he never saw before. The rabbi of the town, rabbi, the rabbi of Krakow, Rabbi um, Avram Horowitz was giving an intricate um, teaching in Talmud. And this boy just stood up on top of a bench and, and was listening to every word. But he had never gone to school. So it was unlikely that he would understand anything. But he kept on coming back. He kept on coming back. Whenever the rabbi would speak, he would be there and he would listen. And one of the more prominent um, gvirim, one of the more wealthy people in this town, whose name was... Reb Mordechai Gutnard. Reb Mordechai Gutnard, uh, he noticed his boy coming every night to listen to the rabbi. And he came over to him one day and he says, I see you're listening to the rabbi. Um, do you understand what he's saying? And the boy says, sure. He said, can you tell me what he's saying? He said, yes. He begins to repeat verbatim the entire class, the entire intricate Talmudic teaching of the rabbi, of Rabbi Horowitz, this little boy who was never been to school, he remembered the whole thing. So this, Rabbi Mordechai was incredible, he couldn't believe it. So he asked the boy, where do you where do you study? He said, I don't study anywhere, I don't go to school. He says, really? He says, why is that? He says, my parents can't afford it. He said, okay, can I, can I uh, meet your parents? He says, sure. And they go back to his home. His father, of Aaron, and the Mordechai have a short discussion. And the Mordechai says, listen, I want to pay for his schooling. I want to support him. I think he has he has something special. But on the condition that I, the Mordechai, will merit to have my daughter marry this of Reclinimus when he becomes of age. Deal is made. And Reclinimus, this child, he is now um, studying Torah in a different level. The teacher, and he's successful. And sure enough, when he turns bar mitzvah, he is married to the daughter of this Reb Mordechai, uh, and his bar mitzvah. And in those days, it was very common to get married so young. In fact, um, today is the yard site of Rapil Paracher, uh, the eleventh of Av, is yard site of, of Rapil Paracher, who actually got married before his bar mitzvah. Chasidim call Rapil Paracher Talus and Tefillin. Call him Talus and Tefillin because. Um, he put on a talus before he wore tefillin. He got married before he was bar mitzvah. That's how it was very common in those days. Anyway, so so this uh, Reb Kleinimus is very successful in his learning. And in the town of Krakow, a visitor arrives. The visitor was Reb Melech of Lezhensk, the student of the Mzitsha Magid, the Praman Chassidic Rebbe. And Reb Kleinimus is so attached to this, um, this tzaddik, 
he was, in those days, there was a fire raging among the Jewish people, a great argument between the proponents of Hasidus and those who opposed it. And so his arrival didn't get the um, proper attention that it would have gotten. Um, but he was invited to one synagogue, the synagogue of uh, Rab Shapiro, the Megala Mukes, Jamel Kulvizhansk is there, and when is Kalman, he decides to come to come to the show. He sees Ramel Kulvizhansk, and he is he is blown away. He realizes that this is something else, mm-hmm. something he never saw before. And he asks permission from his wife. He wants to go visit. He wants to go stay with Ramelich, meet Ramelich, and be there for the holidays. His wife encourages him. She was from a prominent family. However, her father was very against this. His father, her father's like, I don't want to have any anything to do with this um, with this crazy thing. Going, getting involved in in a uh, the Hasidim were ostracized. The Jewish people very against this. So she had, his wife had, a, um, a tichel. She had a kerchief, which had, which had diamonds and other um, jewelry in this, in this kerchief. She sold it and pawned it in order to be able to support herself and her husband's visit to Lezhensk. He traveled to Lezhensk. On the way to Lezhensk, interestingly, he stopped by the town of Lublin and the choys of Lublin. There was also a chassidic rebbe wanted him to stay with him, but he was set on visiting Ramelech, he comes to Ramelech, he says he spends the holidays with Ramelech, and Ramelech decides that he wants to apprentice, or he wants him to learn from another tzaddik, whose name was Ramelech of Zlachev. Ramelech of Zlachev spends two months with him, and he sends a message back to Ramelech, he says, Ramelech, you don't have many kleinimuses out there, this guy is unique, you, gotta, you, you want to take this guy back. So, Ramelech and the kleinimus became very, very close, and he spent a long time there. Now it's time to go back home. He comes back home and his father-in-law is enraged, incensed, and he uh, doesn't want anything to do with him. So he goes to a uh, synagogue and the whole town is in uproar about this guy who had, who had left his wife to join the Hasidim and the Hasidim were ostracized. And so he goes into the synagogue and he's studying Torah in the synagogue. His wife comes there and she tells him that, yeah, my dad's really upset. But people, friends of, of Reb, Reb Mordechai, friends of his father-in-law, prevail upon him to at least go speak to his son-in-law, at least go hear his side of the story. He comes to see his son-in-law, he opens up a Gemara, he shows him a toast, so he says, well, if the Hasidus has any value, tell me what this toast is about. All right? He shows him the toast in the blink of an eye, he tells him the, the meaning of the Tosos. And so his father-in-law is really, he realizes that this is something special because he had asked all the other great Torah giants the meaning of the Tosos and no one had known this, the meaning of the Tosos. And so he realized this guy is blessed with, with a unique gift in Torah. And so he, they, 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 they reconciled. But unfortunately, the uh, rabbi of the town was under the influence of the rumors about how Hasidus is so against Judaism, so they put a ban upon him. But Baruch Hashem, eventually, um, the teachings of the Mor Veshemesh, of Reklamus Kalman, are spread among all the Jewish people, including this teaching, which I just shared, is something which, which, is, very, which is famous. And in the month of Av, we increase in joy. By increasing in joy, it takes away all the negative uh, events that happen in the month of Av. As it says in Yaakov Yermia, why did the lion destroy the lion in the month of the lion? It is in order that the lion rebuild the lion in the month of the lion. And he explains, the lion refers to the Ruch it was called the lion. He destroyed the temple. The temple is called the lion. The, 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 art, the um, altar is called the lion because fire came out from heaven in the shape of a lion to consume the sacrifices. And... So the lion, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, the Babylonian king, destroyed the lion, destroyed the temple in the month of the lion. The sign of the month of Av, the fifth month of the year, is a lion. So why did this happen? It's all in order that the temple should be rebuilt. In order, in order that God should rebuild the temple, God is also called a lion, should rebuild the temple in the month of the lion, in the month of Av. That's what it's about. So this idea of the temple being destroyed for the purpose of it being rebuilt forever is something which also has a personal relevance to each of us and every Jew 
in his service of Hashem, in his connection to God, that sometimes things happen to you in your life that seem like destroying you, and yet they are meant to bring something greater in the future. On that note, uh, I'll share with you one story that just happened this past Shabbos, very interesting thing. I'm leaving our synagogue, and uh, I uh, notice there's a lady who just entered the synagogue as I'm leaving, and I figure she must be traveling from somewhere, and she needs a place to go for Shabbos. So she's Chinese, but I met more than one Chinese Jew before. Hi, um, she says, are there any are there services here? So yes, services are over. Where are you going for the Friday night meal? I'm not going anywhere. Okay, so we inv- I invited her to our home. Baruch Hashem, uh, my wife is very organized, and every person at our table is always given a, a place card by their seat. Everyone has exactly, knows exactly where to go. And as organized as she is, uh, that's how spontaneous I am. So we always have guests which have the place card, guests without the place card. Anyways, this lady um, is not Jewish. And she is a professor who is very proficient in Hebrew, in Yiddish, in Jewish civilization. She teaches about Jewish civilization in China. And she has a lot of students, and she tra- she's now traveling through various cities, and as part of her tour, she thought it would be a good idea to, to learn about the Jews in Los Angeles, and she came to our synagogue of all synagogues, and, and so anyway, she's at our Shabbos table. We have a tradition in our Shabbos table. We ask all of our guests to share their highlight of the week. And one of our guests, everyone is a different level in their Judaism, different part of the journey, and one of our guests... Um, made a step forward in keeping Shabbos and he was very proud to present to his to our Shabbos table how he made a condition with his um, new work that he's not going to um, be able to work on Shabbos or holidays. He's made a condition, a stipulation, I can accept this position but I need to be off on the holidays. I may not keep Shabbos perfectly but this is the agreement we have to have. Step one. And as he shares this, but after he shares this, I just asked this, this, this Chinese professor, by the way, I asked her her name. She speaks fluent Yiddish, fluent. What's her name? She didn't know, know how, to, how to say her name in a way that I would get it. So she told me, Mem Nun Gimel. I guess it's Ming or whatever. So uh, she says, ask her, why are the Chinese so interested in the Jewish people? Why do they want to know about us? So she says something very interesting. She says, the Chinese notice that the Jewish people are successful in many areas. They're successful in finance, they're successful in the arts, they're successful in, the, in, 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 in science and mathematics, and they make a huge impact in the world. And they want to learn what, what it is. It's also fascinating. The Jewish people don't um, live in the same country, and yet they all are connected to their Jewishness after so many thousands of years, after being exiled from their land. How does this work, the Chinese want to know? So I asked her in Yiddish, Nu astan plektem sod, Nu that you figure out, did you uncover the secret, did you figure out the secret? She didn't recognize the word sod. She does zeh lashon hakodesh, is that in Hebrew? I think it's also a Yiddish word too. She says, she says, it's a secret. What's the secret? What do the Jews have in common? All the generations, all different places, what, what can you, what's the thread that ties them all together? It's out of the clear blue sky. This is what she says. She says, Shabbos, the mitzvahs, the Torah, and she says these words, more than the Shabbos guards the Jew, the, I'm sorry, more than the Jew guards the Shabbos, the Shabbos guards the Jew. That's what she says. And I can tell you how, what an impression it made on our guests. I mean, it's one thing to hear that from me that's as a rabbi, but to hear this from a Chinese professor who doesn't espouse to have any faith in all this, and yet oh, this is what it's about. This is what it's about. That's what the Jewish people, after the Jewish people are here, this is what keeps, keeps them to be together, this is what helps them become, to be successful. It's their connection to their Jewishness, to their Torah and the mitzvahs, that's what makes it happen. And that's what she shared, and, and that's, that really was shared the right time for our uh, guests. I wanted to actually ask her, um, uh, I don't know Yiddish as well as, as she does, and, and I asked her, how do you say you're welcome in Yiddish? She actually helped me discover how do you say you're welcome? In Yiddish, the uh, w- w- people say, which means there's no reason to say thank you. 
but the correct way, a better way, of saying th- you're welcome in English is mitfargin with great pleasure. I think I shared before how the previous Rebbe told my grandfather, whatever you do, we mitfargin again, do with pleasure. So sometimes you don't know why things are happening, but Hashem is always guiding us to something, to his, to a destiny that is beyond our knowledge. On that note, I'll share with you an unbelievable story. Rabbi Reber shared the story with me t- today from the Chaim Weekly. Unbelievable story. A classmate of mine, Rabbi David Goldstein, Dain Gesund, Rabbi's emissary to West Houston. He's also the chaplain of uh, many prisons in the, tex- in the Texas uh, Department of Criminal Justice. He has uh, over 150,000 um, inmates in his care, those who sign up for the Jewish program. He's, he knows the Jews. But um, he, um, he, he got a uh, call from this this um, Project Innocence, which is bent on perfect, per- protecting people from capital punishment. And they call up and they say, do you know about this guy, which I will call Yankel? Yankel is on death row. Do you know Yankel? He didn't know Yankel. Yankel didn't sign up for the Jewish program. So Yankel has very little time to live. And uh, I thought you should you would be interested to know about Yankel. He was interested. The Jew was on death row. He immediately researches this Yankel. And he discovers that Yankel is um, Jewish, yes, but he is guilty of horrible crimes, of killing many people, innocent people, but he's our brother nonetheless, and he, has to, and he wants to go visit him. It's not an easy thing, but uh, that's, uh, that's what the Rebbe taught us. Every Jew is a Jew, even, even someone who is acting in a horrible way. So he calls up Yankel's mother, and Yankel's mother says that um, Yankel is Jewish. He's probably not interested in meeting you, but you could try. But um, she also mentioned that Yankel wants to be cremated. Rabbi Goldstein says, Yankel can't be cremated. You know what it does to the soul. She was not religious at all. She wasn't interested in hearing about this. He says, please, I don't want to hear about this. It doesn't matter to me. Yankel wants to be cremated. He's going to be cremated. And it doesn't really matter. So Rabbi Goldstein sets out to visit. Yes, he, although... Prisoners on death, death row don't usually have visits, but he, as a religious um, visit, he was given permission to speak to Yankel for 20 minutes. Yankel comes in to this special room in the prison, all chained up. The Goldstein came with a colleague of his, and they sit down together to talk to Yankel. Yankel starts a conversation with this. If you guys want to talk to me about Judaism, I am not interested. So the, the meeting can end right now. If this is about Judaism... I'm not interested. So Rabbi Goldstein does know how to like continue the conversation. If it's not about Judaism, like how does he continue? He doesn't want to be. Um, he doesn't want to be facetious or presumptuous. He says no problem. We won't talk about Judaism. But he talks about whatever he talks about. And he sneaks in the tidbits about Judaism. Yankel's like no, 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 no Judaism. Okay, no Judaism, no problem. So they ask Yankel about his life and how we, he grew up, and, and it, it was unnerving, it was surreal to hear Yankel talk about how he felt about his crime, and how he, what brought him to his crime, he had a really hard upbringing. And then uh, my friend, Rabbi Goldstein, says to him, I hear you're into Kabbalah. He says, oh, I love Kabbalah, I love Kabbalah. Yankel, Yankel was into this thing called Kamea. Kamea is a Kabbalistic um, amulet. There are various amulets. You worn for protection that that the real Kabbalists are able to make, and I'm sure you can Google all kinds of fake ones today. But you need a Kabbalist who is actually in touch with Kabbalah to make a real amulet. Otherwise, it's just not worth not worth a dime. Anyways, the ankles and the ankles into these these uh, into these kameas, into these amulets. Okay, cool. Um, the ankle. Um, what do you know about Kabbalah? He says, I know the Hebrew alphabet, and real, you know the Hebrew alphabet. What's your um, favorite letter? Oh, my favorite letter, says Yankel, is Shimu. And he holds up three fingers. Shimu. So Rabbi Goldstein knows exactly what he's talking about. You, t- you mean the letter Shin? He says, yes. I love that. I heard King David had a shield. And on his shield, there was the letter Shin. So Rabbi Goldstein says, so do you want to be a warrior like King David? He says, yeah, I want to be like King David. So David Goldstein takes out his tefillin, and on the tefillin, 
on the head tefillin, on both sides of the head tefillin, there is the letter Shin. He says, Yankel, you want to put this on? Yankel says, yeah. So he puts on the film with the ankle. He says the Shema with him. And all of a sudden, this beastly person all of a sudden melts completely. And he just cries and cries and cries. The 20 minutes were long over, but the guard was taking a uh, well-deserved nap. He didn't know that the, he was out. And Rabbi Goldson used the opportunity to give this guy a chance to dive and dive. Then he says to him, could I give you a hug? And the man says, if you want to, if, if it helps you, the Goldstein says, yeah, it helps me. He gives Yankel a hug. The Goldstein leaves Yankel. And he says to him, I'm sure that God will bring us together again one day. But until then, chazak v'yamatz. Be strong and be courageous. He leaves Yankel. He goes home. And, oh, I forgot to mention, he said to Yankel, do you want to be buried like a Jew? Yankel says, well, if it's important to you, it doesn't matter to me, no problem. And he said, I'll tell my mother about it. Okay. He gets a phone call after Yankel's execution three days later. But Yankel said to her the following thing. Yankel said, for the eight years that he was in death row, no one treated him like a human being. He was always ridiculed, he was always scorned, he was always treated bad the first person that treated him like a human being, Rabbi Goldstein. And if it's important to him that I be buried like a Jew, I want to be buried like a Jew. And Yanko was brought to Kavri Yisrael. Yanko was brought and buried like a Jew. Which brings me to our last story for tonight. Actually, I have two more stories. Two more stories. Um, the first story is in, the, in this week's uh, Ami magazine, unbelievable story. Um, doesn't say the story with a name. But it's a first-hand story shared to this um, to, to to a writer of the magazine. This guy is a prominent Magid Shir. Teaches a high level of, of Talmud in a very known yeshiva. Yeshiva's not, name is not listed, and he's doing. He's not only a teacher of, of Talmud. He gets into the lives of the students. He gets into their lives, and he tries to encourage them to. Um, everyone needs needs a soldier to cry once in a while, once in a while. And he in the yeshiva, he's the guy that, that people do this. People talk to him openly, and he's, he uses his position to really help the students and to put them in the right place and to put them in the right way. And, it, and he's successful and he loves what he's doing. His whole, he went to classes to learn how to deal with adolescence, and this was his life. This was what every waking hour that he had, that he had, he, he dedicated to his students. He loved his students. Anyways, this rabbi notices that there is a discussion coming up in the next faculty meeting about uh, Reuven Goldstein's grandson. Reuven Goldstein's grandson was not someone that yeshiva would normally take. The yeshiva only took students who were serious about their learning. This wasn't a yeshiva for people which were um, not into learning. It was a yeshiva for only those who were really into it. But Reuven Goldstein was a prominent... He was the major benefactor of this yeshiva. And because he was the benefactor of the yeshiva, so his grandson got a little more attention than others in the same position. And the yeshiva decided to accept him. But they accepted him without the under, um, the unannounced uh, condition of his acceptance was that this rabbi was going to take him under his wing. He's going to learn with him, he's going to, and he's going to help him. This boy didn't really um, value the fact that he was given this chance. He, he, he wasn't into it. Right from the first day, he came late, he wasn't attending, and when he came, he had this like look on his face, like, Ugh, why am I here? Very, very not in touch with his surroundings, not in touch with his environment, not wanting to be there at all. But this rabbi didn't give up. He played basketball with him, and he listened to him, and he got him into it. He got him into it, and he was studying Torah, and because of this, when, when Passover came, Reuven Goldstein sent a handwritten note with a gift. Thank you. Thank you for giving my grandson all this attention and putting him on a good path. Thank you for saving his life. Shortly after Passover, this rabbi noticed that Reuven Goldstein's grandson is not doing well. He's having these 
He's just having these strong mood swings. Like one day he's studying Torah for many hours, next day he's not showing up, and he started talking to the boy, and the boy mentioned he has suicidal thoughts. So this rabbi realized this is beyond his forte, and he and other faculty members shared with the family that they think that this boy needs more serious help, needs to be under the care of a psychiatrist, a medical professional, they, they can't really provide the assistance that he needs in the yeshiva. Reuven Goldstein wasn't having it. Reuven Goldstein dragged this rabbi's name from the mud and started telling everyone how this guy is, this rabbi is so terrible, has a bad influence. He called other parents of other boys in the school, saying to them, you want this rabbi to stay away from your child, he's a bad influence. My grandson was perfectly normal, and then he ruined his life, and he messed him up, and he's and he, and uh, this Reuben Goldstein wasn't satisfied with this. He comes to the yeshiva, he goes over to the rabbi, and he screams at him. He yells at him, "How dare you! How dare you do what you're doing to my grandson? How dare you have no shame? Have you, you're, you're you're not meant to be an educator. You're in the wrong business. You shouldn't be doing this." So this rabbi, um, he he didn't respond. The Talmud says, if you're shamed by others and don't shame in return, it forgives you for all kinds of sin. And uh, he didn't respond. And he, he thought, okay, he got hit in the head, but that's it. But he, that was just the beginning. He made, an, he made a campaign to get this guy fired. And one day, the head of the yeshiva calls on the rabbi and he says to him, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say this to you. It's not my decision. But this guy, Ruben Goldstein, has threatened to withdraw support from the yeshiva if you are still a faculty member. And the board had a meeting, and it wasn't my decision, this is passed to me, you're no longer part of the faculty. It was really hard for him to hear this. So hard for him to hear this, and it really got him into a depression. He was totally unexpected. This was, the rug was pulled out from underneath him. He couldn't believe it. I mean, like, here he had helped this guy so much, and helped the family so much, and they recognized it, and all of a sudden, for no reason at all, he was tossed. But Baruch Hashem, by divine providence, he got a better position in another yeshiva. And he was very happy in this new position, a better position, much more benefits, and much more um, suited to his, to his um, uh, talents. He was appreciated, and it went well a long time. One day, years later, he gets a call. The call is from uh, Reuben Goldstein. Reuben Goldstein says to him, do you remember me? He says, of course I remember you. Reuben had become a changed man from when they had first known each other. Reuben was a wealthy man who was, spoke with the confidence of that kind of uh, background, of, with the power of the dollar behind him. And uh, Reuben said, I want to meet you. And he says, why do you want to meet me? He says, I'd rather not say. I'd rather say when I meet you in person. He met him the following night, and Reuben was clearly uncomfortable. And he said these words, You were right about my grandson. Yassi, my grandson, as you suspected, had an underlying problem. It took us years to figure this out. You only figured this out because he had a dangerous manic episode, and we discovered he was bipolar. It took us years to get him stabilized. If only we had listened to you and gotten professional help, it would have spared everyone so much aggravation. He said, I don't know why I waited all these years to contact you, but I was just so, so ashamed. But now, he says, I'm gonna, I have a terminal illness, and I'm staring death in the face, and I realize the hurt, the extent of the hurt that I inflict, inflicted upon you, and the doctors say I don't have much time. And listen, my money gave me a sense of power, and there's nothing else in my life that I had joy from, but I know it's not an excuse and I'm terribly sorry for what I've done. What I've done, I want to ask your forgiveness. So Reuben's vulnerability melted his heart and forgave him. So don't worry, I completely, I completely forgive you. The story doesn't end there. A little while afterwards, Reuben calls him up. He says, I'm in the hospital. Please come to the hospital. He comes to the hospital. And Reuben says this. He says, you're a good person. I'll never forgive myself for my nourish. I'll never forgive myself for my foolishness. That I had a hard time accepting the truth, 
I wish I could make up for what I did, but I can't. All I could do is ask you to please continue teaching God's children. And with that, he shakes his hand in his hand. He had a place a check. And the check was for an astronomical sum. Reuben passed away three weeks later. And that is, um, just highlights, again, is a similar story as the one before, that sometimes there is a destruction of a temple which causes the rebuilding of an everlasting one. Which brings me to the last story for tonight, really. This story was shared by a very prominent source, a student of a, of a student of the Arizal, whose name was the Emek Melech. The Emek Melech said that he was a student of a student of the Arizal. His teacher was a student of the Arizal, who was Yorte with this past Sunday. The Arizal uh, once gathered his students together. It's a first hand account of the Arizal, a story, not just a story you read. The Arizal gathers his student to get students together, and he says to them, He wants to read the Torah with the seven shepherds. The seven shepherds are Moses, Aaron, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and King David. He wants to read the Torah with the seven shepherds. However, he does, he's afraid to do it because he's afraid that one of the students is going to laugh. And if they laugh, it's going to be, it's going to be God forbid, this could, God forbid, adversely affect them. The level they were on, the level of righteousness that they were on, that even that just slight thing of laughing out of turn was considered something that was of capital punishment for them. And it's hard for us to understand this, but the result said, he doesn't want to do this. This could cause some, one of them to die. I see with divine, provi- divine inspiration, this is not a, a safe thing to do. The students were really, really excited. Imagine seeing Moses and Aaron. Wow. They begged the Rizal, the Rizal agreed. And the Torah reading began. The first Aliyah, Aaron was given the Aliyah. Aaron Akoyin, Moshe Rabbeinu's his brother, he was given the Aliyah of Kohen. Moshe Rabbeinu was given the Aliyah of Levi. And then Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And Yosef was given Shishi. And each person, when they're given the Aliyah, they read the Torah. And all the students, you know, they're looking at Moses and Aaron, and it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But then King David gets an Aliyah. King David, David HaMelech, is known for dancing with joy before Hashem. And his dancing was his great, unique merit. It wasn't something that everyone recognized as a merit. In fact, the famous story that when King David was, was dancing, when the Ark of God was brought to Jerusalem, he was dancing and singing so much that his wife, Shaul's daughter Michal, said to him, I heard that the king of Israel was dancing today like one of the empty people. And King David responded, God has chosen me instead of your father because of this joy, because of this humility. This joy was the way King David approached the Torah scroll that day in the Arizal synagogue. And he came and danced in front of the Torah and grabbed the Sefer Torah and hugged and kissed it. And he said the blessing of the Torah with dancing and singing as King David could. And one of the students laughed. It, was, it looked funny. He laughed and unfortunately he passed away that year. So the Emek Melech says the message of the story is that how we have to, we we're called to get, get Aliyah in the Torah, we have to go and run to get the Aliyah with joy and happiness. And as I mentioned from the claim of his Kalman, the murder of Hashemesh, the way to get rid of all the negativity of the month of Av, the way to get to David ben Yishai, the way to get to the coming of Mashiach, who is a grandson of King David, is specifically with joy and with happiness and, and dancing and singing in the month of Av. May Hashem bless us all to be blessed with lots of happiness, lots of reasons to be happy. And there's two ways to live. You could decide to be happy and then see the success or, or uh, wait for the success and to be happy. But we shouldn't wait. We go first with the happiness, knowing that Hashem is with us, Hashem is blessing us, and bringing us to the coming of Mashiach, to go with the joy and dancing like, like King David, and merit to greet Mashiach Tzadkainu himself, tonight, Mamish, in Shulay Merakedesh, part of Mamish. Akudavach, and Afrelech Avach. Any questions or comments? Right, 15 the Rav is coming up on Tuesday night. 15 the Rav and on, it says, whoever adds in Torah, God adds life to their life. Who adds Torah at night, the 15 the Rav and on, Hashem not just gives you a longer life, but adds more life in your life. 
you think if, no, if you're not, uh, so when you're a Torah study, you want to do, do less of it. But the truth is, it says in Chassidus, when you add something to Judaism, it will open a new channel of, of blessing, of happiness, of wisdom, of alacrity, of energy. Um, to do anything, when you add, decide to do something good, it just makes it happen, makes it possible. Um, Amen.